everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of Tonal Talk. We are going to be joined by the author of The Miracle Morning. We have limited time today, so I am going to pin this to the top of the group and we will get started. I know that a lot of people might be watching the news right now, um, doing whatever you're doing or working, that too. But if you're here, say hello. Let me know that you're watching and let's get our guest in here. So Hal Elrod is on a mission to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. As one of the highest rated keynote speakers in America, creator of one of the fastest growing and most engaged online communities in existence, well, aside from the official tonal community, <laughs> and author of one of the highest rated best-selling books in the world, The Miracle Morning, which has been translated into 27 languages, has over 2,000 five-star Amazon reviews, and is practiced by daily by over a half a million people in over 70 countries. He is doing exactly that. Please help me welcome Hal Elrod. Hi, Hal. Hey, Kate. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. We matched today. We yeah. Really well, if you wear black any day, you'll match me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us today. Um, the Miracle Morning, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but it has been having a profound effect on my life and the community has been loving it as well. So it's just such an honor to be able to chat with you. And I have to give a shout out to Ryan Levesque, who introduced us. Um, yeah. of Ask. He's a great guy too. So I just wanted to say thank you to him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Ryan for connecting us and thank you for the community for, you know, being uh, members of the, really the, your community are, I guess, also the Miracle Morning community because um, yeah, I think that all, all of us are, are on the same page with waking up every day, becoming the best version of ourselves and then impacting the world as much as we can. Absolutely. It's, it's been, it's really elevated the, the vibrations in our community this month, I must say. People are sharing their experiences and talking about their families getting involved, and it's just been really wonderful, so thank you. Very cool. We'll get right in with into the questions. I only have yeah. you for 30 minutes, so let's get to it. Um, when we introduced the Miracle Morning to the community in our kickoff uh, tonal talk, the questions that we got the most were about affirmations and visualizations. So I wanted to jump right into affirmations, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about some of the mis misconceptions and mistakes you see people make, and yeah. your formula for creating affirmations that actually work. Yes, I love it. Affirmations are my favorite of the savers, so I, I love starting here. Uh, I get asked that sometimes. Do you have a favorite saver? And the politically correct answer, I think, would be like, no, they're all equally important, right? But no, I, I, I love affirmations. And uh, in terms of the misconceptions, I think the reason that most people that have tried affirmations before the Miracle Morning, and if, if they didn't land for you, if they didn't resonate with you, they didn't feel authentic, it's one of two problems in the way we've been taught affirmations for, I don't know, for decades. Number one is we're taught to lie to ourselves, essentially. In other words, state something as true that may not yet be true, but you want it to be true, right? So if you wanted to be a millionaire, you would just say, I am a millionaire. I am a millionaire, right? Until you believed it. Or if you want to if you want to lose weight or be thin, but you're overweight in your mind, you go, I am thin. The problem is, if we tell ourselves something that we don't believe is true, then the truth will always prevail. If you say, I am a millionaire and you're struggling financially, your subconscious is going to go, you're not even a thousandaire. Like, what are you talking about? Right. And so you're fighting with reality. So lying to yourself is never the optimum strategy. The second problem with affirmations is we're taught to use this flowery passive language that produces a mat or promises a magical result independent of our effort. And it makes us feel good in the moment because it gives us this illusion that everything's going to be okay. Just, just everything's going to be okay. Just, just wait for it. Right? So an example of this is there's a really popular financial affirmation that says, I am a money magnet. Money flows to me effortlessly and in abundance. Uh, while there may be some truth to that, I don't know. Most people that have built a, you know, financial freedom or financial security they didn't do it by sitting back on their couch, staring at a vision board, telling themselves they were a magnet and money was going to show up. Usually they had to really, they had to get clarity. They had to work hard. They had to produce value into the world. Then that value was reciprocated with monetary compensation from other people, right? So telling yourself money's coming might make you feel good in the moment, 
but it's counterproductive to actually getting you to go, okay, no, 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 no. Money's not going to magically show up. I've got to go out there and create value for my employer, for the world, if I want to you know, create this financial security. So three steps to make affirmations really practical, really tangible, and results-oriented. Step one, affirm what you're committed to. So for me, that the template would be, I am committed to blank. No matter what, there is no other option. So if you want to be financially free, don't say you are financially free. Say, I am committed to earning X amount of dollars, to generating this much business, this, whatever it is. Get really clear on a commitment that would be your ideal outcome so you can reaffirm that commitment every day. Step two, affirm your whys. Why is this? Why is that outcome meaningful to you? Why is it a must? Why are you willing to do whatever it takes to achieve that outcome? Um, so when I had cancer, for example, uh, I would affirm step one, right? I am committed to beating cancer and living to be 100 years old alongside Ursula and the kids, no matter what, there's no other option. And whenever I felt the fear that I might die and leave my kids without their dad, which was every day, something I thought of, I would pull up the affirmation and with conviction and passion and energy, I would say, no, like death isn't an option. I'm committed to beating cancer and living to be 100 no matter what, there's no other option. But then step two is where it really, it really got its legs. I said, I'm committed to beating cancer for my wife, Ursula, because I promised her forever in a day. I'm committed to beating cancer for my kids, Sophie and Halston, because they, they need my love, leadership, and guidance for the rest of my long life. I'm committed to being cancer for my mom because she doesn't deserve to lose another child. I'm committed to beating cancer for my dad because he gave up everything to save my life. I'm committed to beating cancer for myself because I deserve to live a long, healthy life. And I would, I would sit with these affirmations, each one, and I would feel it. And last but not least, I'm committed to beating cancer for the millions of people who are themselves battling cancer or some other disease and haven't been blessed with the knowledge or resources I have. And they need my leadership and guidance. And that, that second step, that's what fueled me when I felt like giving up, when I, when I was exhausted, when I was sick, when I was in pain. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. I'm committed no matter what to beat cancer for all of these reasons. So that step two is crucial. H have the bullet points of why. And then step three, um, which specific actions will you take and when? So that way, this isn't a fantasy that you're affirming. You're affirming a measurable outcome. You're reinforcing it with the reasons why you're committed to it. And then you're clarifying the specific action or actions that you'll take and when you will take them. And so every goal that you have in your life or every role that you play from parent to you know, uh, spouse to business person in your income, your health, your finances, I follow those three steps as the foundational formula. And it's just three sentences, maybe a few bullet points for each area of my life. And that way, now you're affirming something that, again, it's practical, it's tangible, and you're in control of the things that you're going to do to achieve that outcome. And now it's not a fantasy. Now you're not lying to yourself, but it's real. I love that because it's so much more action oriented and it makes you feel like you have a, a sense of control over it and that you can do something about it instead of just expecting money to walk through your door. Um, yeah. And I think you mentioned it, but my question was, do you recommend uh, taking one goal from each area of your life and doing maybe five every morning? Or do we focus on work this month and then family the next month and whatever the next month? Or, or is it just up to the individual person? Um, I, honestly, it's, you know, I like to say, tell people that there's a lot of flexibility with the miracle morning and with affirmation specifically. And the simplest form an affirmation is just a reminder of something that's really important to you. So if you think about it, well, what's important to you? Hopefully it's the things you're committed to, right? Why you're committed to them and what you're going to do to achieve them. So for me, I have an affirmation. You know, I've got my will of life every year that I do where I assess, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how am I in my relation, my marriage as a parent on and on and on on my finances, and then I have my goals in each area, and I have an affirmation for each of those, and I read them every single day to keep them top of mind. And then that doesn't mean that I work on them every day, right? You, there's only so many hours in a day, so I read the affirmations, and then I will ask myself, what, what are, what's the top one to three things I need to commit to get done today to move forward in the areas of these that, that, that matter? And you know, so it'll be different on certain days. Um, you know, I do certain days where I like writing, for example. I write every day. Right. So that's something I'm working towards my writing goals every day. You know, my fitness goals five days a week, typically. Right. So so I've got different actions in my calendar, but they all stem 
from those affirmations. And the affirmations remind me, they keep it top of mind and they remind me, okay, I know what I'm committed to. What can I do today? What am I going to get done today? And that couples really well with visualizations, which I also wanted to talk to you about. And um, I, I wanted to ask, is it something where you're visualizing those things that you just mentioned that you have to get done every day and you're kind of going through the obstacles to get through them or are you visualizing the longer term goal? So they're both of those. And I think that's another a problem with the way visualization has been taught is that we're only taught to visualize the end result, right? You know, make your vision board and see it to believe it. Um, there's value in that because the more you, like if you set a goal, like I, I committed to run a 52 mile, mile ultra marathon when I was first doing the Miracle Morning and I hated running. And the idea of running a mile was out of my comfort zone. So 52 was like, I couldn't even get there. So that was the power of every day I'd visualize crossing the finish line. And what that did is that that got my mind and body acclimated to that possibility. It started to feel like it was realistic when on day one, it didn't feel like that at all. So that's the benefit of visualizing the end result is you start to feel it. You do see it. You do believe it. But the most important aspect or strategy for visualization, in my opinion, is every day you've got to see yourself engaged in the necessary activities that will get you to that destination. And you have to see yourself engaged in those activities in an optimal emotional state. So every morning, I hated the idea of running and think about it, the things in your life that you know you should do, whether it's eating a certain diet or exercising or you know getting on the phone and cold calling people or writing or whatever it is, right? That out of your comfort zone, um, if it's out of the comfort zone, then we tend to you know resist it and we don't do it and we procrastinate. We put it off till tomorrow, 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 and we never do it. So for me, visualization is that mental rehearsal where I would close my eyes and I would see the alarm on my phone going off at 7 a.m. And I would see myself, I would literally picture myself go into the bedroom, get dressed in my running clothes, head out the front door with a smile on my face. And I would always flood my body with positive emotions while I would picture myself seeing the sidewalk. And I'd even affirm things like, I'm committed to going on this run. This is making me a better, stronger, more disciplined version of myself. I'm going to have a great run. I'm going to be glad that I did it. I'm going to feel awesome afterwards. And then I would see myself head out the front door and, and enjoy going on that run. And what that mental rehearsal did is when the alarm went off on my phone at 7 a.m. and it said, run, go for my run. Instead of going, oh, I don't, I don't want to. Maybe tomorrow. I can, I can put off today, right? I, I didn't even think about it. I just did what I rehearsed, right? I just got up, went in my bedroom, got my clothes, got dressed, headed out the front door, and I was flooded. As I, as I saw the sidewalk, just like in my mental rehearsal, I was flooded with those positive emotions that compelled me to head out the front door and actually want to go on that run. And so that's the power of visualization when you don't just use it for the end result, but you see yourself engaged in the daily activities and put yourself in that optimal emotional state that'll compel you to engage in those activities in real time. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to start doing that a little bit more for my waking up early, because with the Miracle Morning, I've been getting up an hour earlier, and it's been great once I'm up, but it's still tough to take that first step out of bed, so I'm gonna try that, thank real you. Real quick, have you printed the bedtime affirmations and tried those yet? I have not, I should so though. Go, go to mymiraclemorning.com, and there's a bunch of bonuses, but, um, the, but the bedtime affirmations specifically are designed to set your intention and kind of your expectation and mindset before you go to bed so that when the alarm goes off, you've already rehearsed being excited and jumping out of bed with energy. And I've had Fortune 500 CEOs tell me that the bedtime affirmations were the game changer for them. So okay. yeah, try those out. I love that you've thought of everything. You have like a bonus article or a, a tip or a blog post here and there just to help with bringing it all together. So it's really easy to follow. And I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about kind of that emotional state you had talked about. And I watched the movie, the Miracle Morning movie, which I was bawling at the end, by the way. <laughs> but <Awesome. laughs> those kids are so cute. And uh, your story is so powerful. But the, the what I really thought a lot about was the time when you had cancer and there must have been days where you just didn't want to, you just didn't want to get up. You didn't want to do your miracle morning routine. You just didn't have the energy or the, the willpower. And maybe we're not battling cancer. The, the rest of us right now, some of us might be, so, but most of us aren't thankfully. Um, but there's just days we don't want to, or maybe we start thinking that, you know, personal development, it's all crap. It's not working, blah, blah, blah. 
what do you say to get us through what, what's your advice to get us through those moments to push through? Yeah, there's a couple things. Um, the first goes back to what I said is being clear on your whys, mm -hmm. right? Your why, why or multiple whys. The, for me, the reading those commitments that I'm committed to beating cancer for Ursula, my wife, right? Because I promised her forever and a day, reading those every day. And I would, those I could do, even if I was exhausted, I was on chemotherapy, I felt sick, you know, I might not be able to exercise that day, but I could, I could roll over and I could read my affirmations and be reminded of what I was committed to. And so that in and of itself, because there were days I absolutely did not have the will to live. And um, I was in so much pain. And also part of it is I'm very at peace with death. Like mm -hmm. I have no fear of death. So it wasn't like this thing I was afraid of. I was like, and so when I felt like just in pain and exhausted and sick, I'd be like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. I just, I'm, 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 God, take me, I'm ready to go, you know? But it was my wise. It was, no, as much as that's tempting to just, just give up, if you will, um, I'm committed for the people in my life that matter most. And I will do whatever it takes for those, for, for my wife, for my kids, for my family. I will do whatever it takes. And that includes pushing through when I don't feel like it. The other strategy that I want to give, and this is, I learned this probably 15 years ago from John Maxwell in his book, Failing Forward. He said that most of us, uh, we only, we, we act based on our feelings, right? Meaning, well, I would, but I just don't feel like it. I don't have the motivation. I don't have the energy. I don't have, right, whatever, whatever it is. And he said, those who do what they feel like don't do much, right? Like those who only limit, like I'm all, I only do what I feel like. Well, it always is easier to do nothing than something. So you're probably going to be unhealthy and not successful if you're only doing what you feel like. I actually had this conversation with my daughter this morning. She's <laughs> 11. Um, I told her how, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. I said, so here, his strategy is that it's act your way into feeling. Mm. Meaning most of us want to feel our way into action. But when you're sitting there lazy, watching television or tired or laying in bed or whatever, right? Motivation doesn't just come up and like grab you and shake you and pull you up, you know, to do the thing. You have to initiate it. And the way it's initiated is with that very first movement, that very first step. The example I like to give is if you want to get in great shape, like physically, you want to go to the gym and exercise and lose weight. Um, you're probably not going to feel like going there, at least in the beginning until you get in a rhythm. More often than not, you're not going to feel like it. So you either do what you feel like or you do what you committed to, which is go to the gym and exercise and get in shape. But here's the simple strategy is that the, um, uh, what's it called? So if you want to get in shape, act your way into feeling. All you have to do is pack a gym bag the night before, right? Maybe even sleep in your workout clothes if you need to. But if you can just don't think about going to the gym and because you'll talk yourself out of it. Just grab your gym bag, set it, get in your car, set it on the seat, set the GPS to the gym, start the car and start driving. That's easy. It takes almost no discipline to start driving, right? But we think ourselves out of it because we put ourselves, oh, I don't have the energy to go run on the treadmill. No, you don't while you're sitting on the couch. But once you get in the car with a gym bag, which doesn't take a lot of effort or energy or discipline, and then you start driving to the gym, Turn on the radio, put down the window. You're probably going, I mean, most likely you're going to drive to the gym. And then once you get there, you're like, oh, I'm here. And I'm a little more awake than when I was sitting on the couch. I blasted some upbeat music. Then you're going to grab your gym bag, walk in the gym. Now the music is blaring. The energy is palpable. People are running on the treadmill, right? And you're probably going to go get dressed in your gym clothes. And you're probably going to go work out. Like it just took that first initial step to get in the car with your gym bag already packed, but then that leads you to going for a workout and then feeling great about yourself that I did it. And now you're more disciplined than you were than that, that morning when you thought about going to the gym. And so when it comes to the miracle morning, being really clear on your why, my why is always, I'm doing this to become the person that I need to be to create everything that I want for my life. To me, if there's not a more universal, compelling reason, then if we're all honest, we want an extraordinary life. And we define extraordinary. That might mean just you get to play with your kids all day, right? 
but it requires some things in place probably for that to happen. Or maybe you want to be really healthy or really happy or a lot of energy, all of those things most of us want. And so if we're really clear on why we're doing the miracle morning or why we're going to the gym or why we're committed to beating cancer or whatever it is, right? We're committed to the why. And then the little, the hack is, all right, I just have to act my way into feeling. I just have to do that one little baby step that that, that one domino that, that sets everything else in motion. That all makes so much sense. And it's about like prepping yourself so that that first domino is really easy to push over. Really easy, exactly. I mean, we've, we've done that at Total. Our members just have to walk over to their Total at home, turn it on, and then the rest is done for them. So. Oh, nice, there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, and on the flip side of when you just don't feel like it, we had a question come in from actually one of our coaches, Coach Jackson, and he wrote, um, I can understand how and why the miracle morning can help when you're struggling or trying to achieve your goals. But what do you do when all the things you've dreamt, visualized and journaled about start to become a reality? How do you keep the fire going and keep that sense of urgency and the desire to keep setting bigger and more impactful goals when, like you said, human nature is to relax a little bit? How do you keep yeah. that fire burning? And should we? Should we always be striving for more? Or should we take a second to just be content and be happy with what we have? It's yeah. About- yeah. That, those are two beautiful kind of questions that that, that inter, intertwine. Um, as far as how to – so, yeah, I'll, I'll answer the how and then we'll, I'll answer the should. Um, the how is – I mean, I think it's unique to each person, but the one thing that we each have in common as human beings – is there's no limit to our potential. There's no limit to who we can become. There's no limit to what we can create or what we can achieve. Um, and uh, and so the how is really being clear on what you know. If you could wave a magic, your you know rub rub the lamp and the genie comes out, and you could you could ask for anything. Well, whatever you would ask for, that's what your heart really wants, right? Like that that that's really what you desire. And so there's always that next level. So you know. For me, when I achieve a goal, even if it's a big goal, then it's like, okay, what's next? And in terms of what keeps me motivated, I think this is really, this is important. I think this is true for most of us. I don't want to speak for other people, but I think it's true for most of us is serving others. That for me, I feel a sense of responsibility that as long as I'm on the planet, as long as I'm here, I have a responsibility to my fellow you know, human beings, my human family. I think we're all just part of a big family. I don't see us as different. I see us as all one and the same. Um, I have responsibility to fulfill my potential in service of others. And so, um, and I think if we all took on that mindset, right? I, I don't, I, I never would claim out of arrogance that I have like the right mindset of it figured out. But from my vantage point, if we all came from that place of, I have a responsibility to my fellow man or woman, to fulfill my potential in service of the greater good. And when I say in service of the greater good, that means there's a few a few things. Well, when you fulfill your potential, A, you're learning how to fulfill a poten- how to fulfill potential and therefore you can help others do the same. I think that's one of the greatest gifts we can give to those that we love and those that we lead is to selfishly or selflessly fulfill our own potential because only then can you share hey you can grab other people by the hand and go, "Hey, I, here's what I did. I, I know what you're going through. I I went through that, but I didn't. I didn't let it let it beat me. I overcame that. And here's how you do that. Here's how you can apply that to your life. So one, when you fulfill your potential, you learn how to do the things that most people either aren't willing to do or don't know how to do. And now you can serve others through your experience and your knowledge. But beyond that, when you fulfill your potential, you now typically have more resources. To like with the Miracle Morning movie, we were able to donate nine thousand two hundred dollars in ticket sales to Miracles for Kids, which is a charity that helps families that have critically ill children and they can't pay their bills. Instead of them going homeless, this charity helps them. If I wouldn't have worked my butt off for six years to make that movie and then six months to launch it, right? There's multiple families that never would have received that benefit. And the month before, we donated fifteen thousand dollars to a charity called IntelliHelp. And they help families that are that that can't afford food during COVID because they lost their job, and so they give them food, right? So to me, if I had settled for, well, I'm making enough money now to pay all my bills, I'm good. I'm just going to retire. I'm just going to chill. I wouldn't be able to help all of the people that I'm helping, and so that's my own personal belief system and, and paradigm is that I feel a sense of responsibility to help every person I possibly can 
And when I don't feel like doing something, I have a little mantra. And that is, it's not about me. Mm How -hmm. get off your ass. It's not about you. <laughs> You're not just living this life for you. You're living this life in service of other people. And so that, so that for me is what keeps my drive going. Um, any questions on that? And then I can answer the should. No, that makes so much sense. And I hope Co Coach Jackson's watching because there are so many people for him to coach and we all need him. So Jackson, keep oh. going. It's not about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not just about us. And so, um, and it can be, by the way, like I don't believe, I believe I would not judge someone if they go, no, it is about me and I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to do whatever. Like, okay, I don't judge it as right or wrong. It's just, that's that's one way, different ways to approach life, right? Um, the uh, In terms of the should, mm -hmm. That's, I know I answered the, I, I think I answered a lot of that in terms of like my should is I have to help people. But right now I'm, I'm balancing, I'm trying to take a sabbatical last year. You know, I've, I've worked nonstop for 20 years and, um, I, uh, after I came off of cancer last year, my plan was to take the year off and focus on health and family, like mental health, physical health and family. And that was it. But I had this movie that my team and I had made for six years and I'm, I, I was like, I couldn't figure out. I'm like, how do I take the year off and <laughs> successfully launch a documentary? And I like, I tried to figure it out and delegate and like, there, I just, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Right. My limited skill set. I, I couldn't figure out how to do that. So I worked my butt off last year, but going into this year, my goal is to take kind of a sabbatical and here's, so here's the answer. Should you take care of yourself and your family first? Absolutely. So what my sabbatical looks like is it's not, it's not where I'm not going to do any work and help any people, just me and my family. It's I'm only going to A, work while my kids are in school. Um, they're in school anyway. I can't spend time with them. Now I'll spend time with my wife while they're in school, but she doesn't even want, she doesn't want to spend all day with me every day, right? Like Some work hell. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. She's like, yeah, no, yeah, because I actually proposed that for her. I'm like, sweetie, I'll just stay home and be like a stay-at-home dad with you and we'll just hang out all day. She's like, no, thanks, Sidney. I could use some, uh, I, I like you in spurts. But um, so number one, working only while my kids are in school. Number two, only doing things that I love doing. Mm. And so that, that for me is it, is, is, you know, is if you get to that place where, you know, you're like, okay, I'm, I, I'm taking care of, I don't, I don't need to do more. Just do the things that you love doing, you know, make it work for you. Find a hybrid where it's not all or nothing. It's not that you dedicate every second of your life to serving humanity and then just burn yourself out, right? And neglect your family or neglect yourself. And it's not that you retire and do not, right? There, there can be a balance. And for me, that's where I'm really, I'm really learning this year how to find the balance, how to say no to a lot when that I normally wouldn't say no to. And, and so that I can say yes to more of, of what fills me up and, and what serves my family and what serves the greater good. And, and I think just setting those boundaries with people just really shows that you're authentically living out what you talk about in the miracle morning. Like when we were texting you, you were like, Hey, sorry, it took me three days to get back to you because I only work during these hours. I was like, that is awesome. Like <laughs> sure, text me back whenever, like that's, I just respected you even more for that. So I, I Thank you. definitely love that advice. Um, we are just about at time. We do have one more question that time one more in. Okay. Thank you. It's about, um, practicing the miracle morning as a family. So, mm -hmm. Perfect segue. Um, Melissa Misty, Misty Johnston said, my family watched the movie while I waited for the book and I'm amazed that my six-year-old and eight-year-old wanted to have their own miracle mornings. Wow. They now have an alarm clock, they get up earlier, they do meditation, visualizations, and wow. affirmations. We're working to add everything on over time. Our mornings are peaceful and as a parent, I'm not yelling at them to get out the door to go to school on time. Win-win for everyone. They even want me to read the book to them. I'm so excited to see where this takes them. So that was really beautiful to have come yeah. in. And um, I just wanted to ask you if you have tips for parents who might want to incorporate this practice with their kids. Yeah. Um, well, there, this, is, this book back here is The Miracle Morning for Parents and Families. Perfect. Um, so that's a good one that give, teaches you how to do it from a family that, that did that. Uh, I was late to the party. Like my kids, you know, it's like anything. My wife's like, I don't want to do your miracle morning. You know, like that's your thing. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a night owl. I'm like, all right. Um, and then my kids, they would like try it and stop. And we're doing it now every day, which is exciting. We started on January 1st. But um, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, you mentioned that she watched the movie with her family. I think, I think that's important. It's mm -hmm. hard 
for so I've, and I've, I know from not only experience, but really other people telling me like, I read your book, it changed my life. And I can't convince my spouse to do it. I can't convince my kids to do it. When you all watch the movie together, it's 90 minutes. It's way easier to watch a movie than read a book. Right. Um, but when you watch the movie, I, I think that exactly what happened, right? We have a, I mean, a six year old and eight year old that are asking to do the miracle morning. Um, and so I would, you know, I would plant the seed, like right when the movie's done and the emotions are high, Hey, you guys want to do a 30 day challenge? You want to try this out? You know, and then if you, and you, the movie will direct you to mymiraclemorning.com and that's like, you get the 30 day challenge and all of that there. Um, but yeah, I mean that, I would say that's the short, easy answer, um, is, uh, is just to watch the movie and start it together. And the other tip I'll give is with your kids, uh, you don't, the, the miracle morning is made up of these six practices, the savers. Um, I don't do all six savers with my kids every day. We just, okay. we mix it up. We'll do medit. Usually we do a guided meditation every day. We use a, an app called waking up and they have a kid's meditation section. Um, we'll do a guided meditation. I almost always have them read their affirmations because as we talked about earlier, that's crucial, you know, to me. Um, and their affirmations, by the way, don't follow that formula to be clear. Like they're, they're much simpler. It's I'm the most grateful person. I know I'm grateful for everything. I I'm positive, you know, like, um, I, I, I tell, always tell the truth. I do the right thing. They're just different statements that for me values that I want to instill in my kids. That's what their affirmations are. And that's just an example of there's no one wrong, right way to do affirmations. Because again, all an affirmation is, is a reminder of something that's important to you. These are affirmations that are reminding my kids of values that, that, that I, well, I aspire, you know, I, I, I hate to say I project on them, but I think they're valuable for all of us to live. And so, um, and I asked my daughter this morning, I go, hey, how do you feel when you read your affirmations? She goes, fine, why? <laughs> I go, well, I go, do you resonate? Like, do they, like, do you feel like these are good things that you want to aspire to like live by? And she's like, oh yeah, absolutely. I was like, okay, yes, that's, that's the goal. So um, yeah, so that's it. Just keep it simple. Do, you can do one of the savers every day. You could mix it up where you do over six days, you do a different one each day. You can just play with it. You know, we usually do two or three. We'll do like meditation affirmations and like a dance party to one song, you know, like keep it simple, keep it fun. It could be cute to have them like pick out of a hat and then they do that one for the day or something. Yeah. Um, and we actually, that's, it's funny you said that we, a long time ago, a friend of mine made me a bunch of affirmations and brought them over and I don't know where they are. It was years ago, but, uh, but yeah, that's how they would do. They'd pull out a, a few and, and read, uh, you know, read, read the new ones. Yeah, it could be a really fun, like, family activity, and then it kind of ties in. Oh, yeah. precious. Well, Hal, thank you so, so, so much. It was so great getting to know you, and thank you for sharing your energy and your time with us. I'm excited to get The Miracle Equation, which is your new book, and yes. read that. I've been reading every day, which is a first for me. So thank you awesome. from the bottom of my heart, and thank you from the community as well for being here with us. Kate, you're so welcome, and thank you for having me, and thank you, everybody, that tuned in. I really, really appreciate you, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in The Miracle Morning community. Yeah, for sure. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.